Are you ready for the next lecture for our class? Today's topic, the presidency. This topic will be approached in this way. First, I'll address the presidency and the Constitution and address things like uh, qualifications, the line of succession in case the president was to die. But the core will address the roles or functions that the president fulfills. Beginning with the administrative function, domestic policy, foreign policy, the military role, and symbolic. The White House clearly is a symbol of America's presidency, and this is where the president does an awful lot of work. The other side of the White House shows the residents. Uh, I was lucky enough a few years back to travel to the White House and to even get a tour. Notice I'm wearing the team colors. This is my family from a few years ago, and we also had our exchange student from Germany. We'll begin by looking at some past presidents and seeing who historians and political scientists argued were the best and the worst presidents in American history. C-SPAN has undertaken an extensive study of the presidency. And uh, whenever one of these studies has been done, uh, the top three has always been the same. The, in the latest poll that was done in 2017 of experts, uh, Franklin Roosevelt came out as number three, George Washington came out as number two, and the best president in American history was Abraham Lincoln. The evaluation of the presidents continued. This was through the Obama administration. Now, many people would argue that Richard Nixon had a failed presidency, but he also had several successes. So he ranks number 28 on the list. Who's the worst president of all time? Well, James Buchanan. He was president on the eve of the Civil War and was unable to breach any kind of a compromise between the North and the South. He was seen as inept. Students at Wetshore were asked, how do you approve of the way Donald Trump is handling his job? Well, President Trump had a 25% approval rating from students here at West Shore Community College. These are students taking American national government earlier this year. Before you say, wow, that's a really bad approval rating, um, you might want to look at some other presidential administrations. Now, again, nobody's going to get tested on this, but just so that you can see, I've been doing this survey for many years, um, and hardly any presidents have uh, uh, scored above 50%. You can see the top would be the, uh, the Trump administration, then the Obama administration, President George W. Bush, and then the Clinton years. So you can see a range of uh, data uh, uh, of approval ratings for these presidents. Next, we'll explore some of the qualifications in order to serve as President of the United States as outlined in the Constitution. The Constitution outlines a few qualifications. The first, as shown here, uh, deals with age. One must be at least 35 years old. Also, you have to be a citizen, a natural born citizen, so a citizen from birth. The easiest way to achieve this is to be born in the United States. There's also a residency requirement. One has to be a resident of the United States for 14 consecutive years prior to running for president. That way, if somebody lived outside the country, it's okay, but you have to reestablish your residency for a minimum of 14 years before you would be eligible to run. The salary of the president? Well, it's $400,000. Now, I don't know about you, but $400,000 is a lot of money, and uh, I probably will never earn that in my lifetime. Uh, but let's compare the president's salary to others. Uh, by the way, we're not exactly sure what Donald Trump's income is uh, because we haven't seen his um, income tax records because he's got a lot of other investments. But his salary as president is $400,000. How does that compare? Well, George Clooney, the actor, makes nearly $240 million. Scarlett Johansson makes over $40 million. By the way, I see a bit of a gender gap there. The boxer Floyd Mayweather, $285 million. And Hawk Tan, who is the CEO of Broadcom, which is a semiconductor and infrastructure software product company, well, he makes over $100 million. So really, the President of the United States 
does not have a very high salary as compared to many other fields. One thing I like to study would be presidential succession, uh, particularly if the president was to die while in office. Are you familiar with the first president to die in office? Well, he's shown here. His name was William Henry Harrison. Let me tell you a story about William Henry Harrison. He was a military hero who had defeated Native Americans at a battle called Tippecanoe. He was first elected to the White House in 1840, but then he didn't listen to his mother. It was very cold when he was inaugurated in 1841, and he delivered the longest inaugural address in American history, and he didn't wear a hat, and he didn't wear gloves. He caught a cold, it turned into pneumonia, and he died about one month into his administration. Supposedly, Harrison died because Native Americans had placed a curse on the White House. Any president elected in a year ending with a zero was supposed to have died while in office, and Harrison started this when he was elected in 1840. Well, let's see how this turned out. Harrison was the first, and he died only 30 days into his administration. He was elected in 1840. 1860, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. In 1880, James Garfield was assassinated. In 1900, William McKinley was assassinated. In 1920, Warren Harding suffered a heart attack and died. And then in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt had a brain aneurysm and died. The curse continued until 1960. In 60, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And then in 1980, Ronald Reagan was shot a couple of months into his presidency in March of 1981. His would-be assassin was John Hinckley Jr., who was soon arrested. This ended the so-called curse on the presidency. Now, if the president was to die, I think most people know that the vice president would take over. But do you know the next two positions in the line of succession? Well, the next person would be the Speaker of the House. And after that, it would be the president pro tempore of the Senate, which is a position that most Americans have never even heard of. The line of succession continues much further, and it's set by federal law. Um, you don't need to know these for a test, but they begin with the Secretary of State, then Treasury, Secretary of Defense, and Attorney General. The line of succession continues on to these additional cabinet level positions. If something catastrophic was to happen, it might go all the way to the Secretary of Homeland Security. An amendment to the Constitution also helps us determine how to fill a vacancy in the Vice Presidency. If the VP was to die or to resign, the President has the authority to nominate a new candidate. However, that candidate must be confirmed by a majority vote in both the House and the Senate. The core of the lecture is next. We'll explore the five major roles or functions that the president fulfills. We'll begin with the administrative function. This role or function is often overlooked by many. Under the administrative function, the president has the ability to either appoint or to nominate maybe as many as three to 4,000 people to a range of administrative positions. There are several examples. One would be ambassadors to other nations. Ambassadors to other countries serve as the eyes and the ears for the administration, maybe even a spokesperson for the president dealing with other countries. Here we see Pete Hoekstra. He is the current U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands. He was actually born there, came to the U.S. as a child, and became an American citizen, and he's the former congressman from West Michigan. Now he's the U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands. Go figure. There are many other examples of people who work in the presidential administration. Maybe the most important group would be the so-called cabinet level officers. This is the most important set of advisors and policymakers for the president. They help the president enforce all laws. Congress passes laws, but the executive branch enforces them. Executive orders outline the steps necessary 
that the administration takes when it comes to enforcing those laws. They actually have the legal force or the authority of a law, and they can require agencies to enforce the laws in very specific manners. However, they cannot violate the law, and they cannot violate the Constitution. Here we see President Trump and President Obama, who each of whom have issued several uh, executive orders during their administrations. It's nothing new to issue an executive order. Here's one. When Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, that was an executive order. Executive orders have become controversial in the last several years, but there's one other caveat I'd like to mention. If one president issues an executive order, it's not binding for future administrations. I will place a hyperlink on Canvas to a clip that Saturday Night Live did in 2014 after President Obama issued an, an executive order dealing with immigration. Um, it's actually pretty funny. So uh, you may or may not want to watch this after the lecture is over with. The next roller function deals with domestic policy. One way the president shapes domestic policy is through the budget. The president is actually required to submit to Congress a proposed budget each year. Now, the president can propose a budget, but unless Congress passes it, uh, it's not binding. Uh, what's important about this, though, is that it outlines the goals that the president has and the top priorities. So you could see an example here of President Trump's 2020 budget. The areas in blue show areas where he wants to increase funding. The areas in yellow show regions where he wants to cut funding. Presidents often have proposals for legislation. For President Trump, it was a tax cut. For President Obama, it was a national health care plan. But the president cannot go to Congress and introduce the legislation. Someone in Congress has to sponsor it. Here's a statistic. About half of all laws originated in some way from the president. Now, this is a little bit of a review, but what I wanted to address was the president's role with lawmaking. Once Congress passes a bill, there are three th things the president can do. First, sign the bill, and boom, it becomes law. If the president's opposed, he could veto the bill, but that veto could be overridden by Congress. If the president does nothing, well, if the president does nothing and 10 working days pass, that bill becomes a law even without the president's signature. But if Congress quits for the year or adjourns within 10 working days, it becomes a pocket veto. For those of you who are wondering, if the president issues a pocket veto, it cannot be overridden by Congress. It's one way the president can really shape lawmaking. So how have different presidents acted when it comes to vetoes, veto overrides, pocket vetoes, things like that? Here are some statistics. No worries, you're not going to be tested on this, but, but we see some early presidents not using it very much. Although Andrew Jackson issued 12 vetoes, more than the previous six presidents combined. Franklin Roosevelt set the record for the most vetoes. Holy how? He had a huge impact on all legislation. Here are some statistics for recent presidents. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of the use of the veto in the last three administrations from George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. The next roller function is foreign policy. Probably the area where presidents have the most leeway or power would deal with American foreign policy. Let's start with a concept. Presidents provide the overall vision for American foreign policy. So, for example, in the upper left, we see President Nixon who opened the door to America's relations with China. On the bottom left, we see President Obama opening U.S. relations with Cuba. And President Trump has made it a major part of his administration to focus on America first. 
The reason why presidents have so much authority is that the president is the person who negotiates all treaties. However, there is a check on the president's ability to do so. In order for a treaty to become a binding agreement, a two-thirds majority vote in support of that proposal is needed in the Senate. However, there's something similar to an executive order that ensures that the president would have control over foreign policy. That is an executive agreement. It's an agreement between the American president and the leader of another country. However, this does not require Senate approval. But again, there's a check on this. It's not binding for future presidential administrations. Here we see a chart that identifies the number of executive agreements as compared to treaties. Notice the arrow is pointing to the Roosevelt administration. As the United States became a world power during World War II in the 20th century, we see the number of executive agreements increasing. Another important role that the president fulfills would be as the military leader of the country. Article 2 of the Constitution outlines the powers of the president, and it declares that the president is, quote, commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and the militia of the several states. The president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Because the president serves as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, many have argued that a president should have a military background. Can you identify these military leaders who have been president? We've got George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Dwight Eisenhower, and George H.W. Bush. While the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, there is a check on the president's ability to wage war. Only Congress has the authority to declare war. In the past, there has been conflict between presidents who have wanted to go to war and Congress who has not declared war. And so in the 1970s, the War Powers Act was passed in order to try to address and outline times when the president could send troops into combat. There are three. First, if Congress declares war. Also, if there's a crisis, the president may act alone for a limited amount of time. And then Congress might specifically give the president the authority to send troops into combat given a particular situation. Now there's no need to copy down this whole slide, but one time recently when Congress did give the president the authority to send troops into combat, yet they didn't declare war, was in the aftermath of the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon in September of 2001. This is the joint resolution authorizing President Bush to send troops into combat. It passed overwhelmingly in the Senate and the House. The last role or function to be discussed would be the symbolic role the president plays as the leader of the country. The president is our top political leader, but the president also serves as a head of state. In many ways, this is kind of similar to a symbolic monarch. Like in Great Britain, the queen doesn't have much power. However, she is the symbolic leader of her country. As the symbolic leader of the country, the president might host a state dinner, as you see here with President Obama. Or on the right, we see President Bush throwing out the first pitch to start the World Series. These really don't have much power associated with them, but they show that the president is the symbolic leader of our nation. President Trump has used new technologies to expand the symbolic role of the president. Here we see the president congratulating the country on the 4th of July holiday. He also is congratulating the winners of the World Series and also has a Thanksgiving Day message to the nation. Some of the president's tweets have been more controversial, criticizing political opponents, possibly insulting foreign heads of state. These have prompted other Republicans even to argue, and this is a quote from Bob Corker, that the White House is an adult daycare. Both Democratic as well as Republican presidents have tarnished the symbolic role of the president in a range of manners. Here we see some sex scandals being highlighted that involve 
Bill Clinton, as well as Donald Trump. There is one actual power that the president has that's associated with this symbolic role. The president can pardon anyone who's been convicted of a federal crime. A selection from the Constitution is shown here. Presidents going back to George Washington have issued a range of pardons of different people who've been convicted of crimes. You see the focus of the Obama administration uh, as they tried to address uh, some nonviolent drug offenders. And Joseph Arpaio was shown here on the right. He was the sheriff uh, in, uh, from Arizona who was pardoned by President Trump. We're just about done. We've got a few concluding comments next. This presentation has addressed a few areas. It involved the different evaluation or rankings of different administrations and um, how the Constitution has addressed the presidency. But the core has addressed the five major roles or functions that the president fulfills. You should be able to describe and then evaluate these five roles or functions and then determine which you believe to be the most important. Well, this is all for lecture number 11, the presidency. Only one more left.